So now we come to our featured speaker. Uh, and it is a pleasure to turn it over to Program Chair Bill Hennigan, who will introduce Dr. John Lewin. Thank you, Cannon. Yeah, I, let me reiterate, this is not a group that's shy on giving advice. So please give us your feedback. We want to make these programs as strong and good as, uh, as we can. And of course, we need your help just like in membership. Uh, today's speaker and his organization sit at the front line of Metro Atlanta and Georgia's ongoing battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. He's been kind enough to join us today in this extraordinarily busy time for him at Emory University, uh, as he and his employees basically are working to save the world. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind everybody, please uh, uh, submit your questions through the YouTube link down below. We've already got a couple. We're delighted. Um, otherwise, Ken and I get to do all the fun stuff and ask all the questions. So if you look at the Emory website, since Dr. John Lewin came to Emory from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, he's become in basically everything over at Emory, except possibly landscaping and valet parking. Uh, I exaggerate, of course. He's got over 30,000 employees, faculty, and staff, and that doesn't include the roughly 3,000 primates and 7,500 rodents that are instrumental in pushing modern medicine forward. Uh, that may be another program, although, albeit a bit controversial. Uh, John has more past accolades, titles, and roles than I could possibly cover here today. I'd encourage you to read his bio and see his extraordinary experiences. Uh, right now, he's currently the Executive Vice President for Health Affairs at Emory University. He's the Executive Director of the Woodruff Health Sciences Center, and he's the President, CEO, and Chairman of the Board of Emory, Health, Emory Healthcare. In his spare time, he's, the, he's also a Professor of Radiology and Imaging, which I think is his first love. He's also a Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Health Policy. He's a national leader in academic medicine strategy and integrated healthcare delivery, and an international scientific leader in interventional and interoperative MRI. He's published over 250 articles, uh, commentaries, and book chapters. He holds 34 US and international patents for MRI inventions. He's been named one of the top 50 most influential physicians in America. Uh, and considered by the Atlanta Business Chronicle as one of the 100 most influential Georgians. I also have on good uh, authority that he is an accomplished jazz saxophonist and has played uh, in, pick, in a pickup band at Johns Hopkins. Uh, John, thanks for being with us today. Uh, I know you've got a lot on your plate. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And it, it is such a pleasure and a privilege to uh, be able to present to this uh, fantastic group. Really appreciate the invitation, Bill, and I'm looking forward to some great questions. Um, so I, I want to uh, start off, and if I could have the uh, slides, please. I want to start off uh, with the next slide of just talking about what does this journey, this pandemic look like uh, for us as a nation, for us as a city, and more specifically in these graphs, for us as a healthcare system. The graph on the, on the left, uh, the graph on the left is what's called PUIs, persons under investigation, plus and, and, and C plus, confirmed COVID. This is what the world looked like in uh, starting on March 12th through uh, actually yesterday. I just updated the slides this morning. Uh, and in fact, what you can see at the beginning of the graph on the left, and, the, and those persons under investigation are people who have had a test, test isn't back yet. So for all intents and purposes, we believe that, you know, these are treated like COVID patients. From March 12th to March 14th, we went from 14 patients in our Emory Healthcare hospitals up to 119 patients, two days, 14 to 119 patients in our hospitals. Over the next four days, we grew to 219. So you can imagine as we started off uh, the, on that scale, there was no, um, to us, it was unknown what was gonna happen a little bit later. Um, things were very, very scary. We had to really make some big changes. The graph on your right is uh, the confirmed cases. So that turns out they, they went up pretty much as quickly, a little bit later. Um, but what you see there is what happened afterwards. We uh, did work to flatten the curve uh, with all the economic pain of sheltering in place, it worked. And you can see how we went down. And by the first week of June, we were down in our hospital, hospitalized patients. We were down from a peak 
of 206 down to about 66. So a big decrease. And we thought, okay, we've got things under control. At that point, it looked pretty much like the European uh, curves that you've seen. Then the last week of uh, June, you could start to see the uptick to our second peak. Um, we peaked about a week ago Tuesday, uh, which was at 352. So we thought that 206 was incredibly frightening. 352 uh, were even more frightening. But fortunately, we can see the last uh, few days, we started to see that decline. Actually, over the last week or so, it's begun to decline. Well, this is a snapshot of Emory, but this is really is a snapshot of Metro Atlanta. We at Emory, for whatever reason, are a leading indicator. Our, up, our upswing was about a week before our peers in the community. Our downslope was also, we were discharging a little before our peers in the community. But this really uh, shows what, what it is like. Uh, and, and again, why we needed to react very quickly. The next slide, please, is uh, the, the sort of outside, uh, the Georgia numbers, US numbers and global. The numbers are from the end of last week. The graphs actually just updated today. And you can see in the state, uh, while we at Emory and Metro Atlanta have started to see a decline, the state has plateaued in the cases, which is that top graph. And uh, the deaths have plateaued, unfortunately, as well at a higher level than we had seen before. Um, so we can talk in questions and answers on what these graphs may mean if, if that's of interest. Uh, but again, the bottom line is uh, things right now are a whole lot more challenging and worse than they were back in the Mar March, April peak for a number of reasons. One thing that's often brought up is, is this just an artifact of testing? And we clearly are, are using our testing more and the top graph, the case rates, are going to reflect the tests. However, the percentage of positive tests have gone up to really new records in the state, which means it's not only the, the amount of testing, it's the actual number of cases that truly are up. Uh, unfortunately, the hospitalizations and the deaths are the best metric of the impact of the disease. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. What I'd like to do over the next few is just talk a little bit about what we did uh, as a healthcare community for prepare, preparedness and response. So the next slide. Well, clearly um, we saw this coming. We saw what was happening in New York. We saw what was happening, happening in Italy. And we very quickly uh, stepped up our crisis uh, command center, what we call our incident command center. It's a very top-down structured uh, reporting system to be able to do quick actions in a crisis. We were fortunate, we were building it on a foundation of a lean culture and an operating system uh, that we've been working on for around the last four years, um, where we have uh, on our daily basis prior to COVID, about a thousand frontline um, daily huddles, preparedness and readiness huddles, and all of our 11 hospital frontline uh, units, most of our 200 ambulatory centers, those roll up for, through a number of tiers starting around 7, 7, 7.30 in the morning, roll up at 9.45 every day into my office suite. Now, of course, it's it's virtual, um, where the Lee of the C-suite team gets together and hears what went on on the front lines that day. That made it much easier to step up this type of incident command. So we created 12 working groups with a breadth of interdisciplinary experts and stakeholders, very strong physician engagement, representation from all of our 11 hospitals and ambulatory operations. And we started meeting uh, what for leadership was four to five hours each day, um, two hours on each weekend day. And we did that for the first uh, solid first couple of months, uh, dropped the weekend days to one. And then uh, finally we dropped off our weekends during that trough. Uh, for a while. And these are very data driven with uh, dashboards on supply chain equipment, census testing uh, all around the uh, all over the uh, the system. So this is what we stood up to be able to really work quickly. Uh, next slide, please. And the first thing that you all heard a lot about was the PPE, the Personal Protective Equipment Challenge. Very quickly, we were in trouble because many, like many of your organizations, no doubt, we worked on a just-in-time inventory. No, no need to waste money uh, for inventory sitting in a warehouse. So we would get twice daily deliveries uh, and uh, would work 
with a pretty thin supply uh, days just day supply on hand. So when Wuhan, China, which is the major uh, region of China in which uh, these personal protective things like masks, gowns, head covering, goggles, most of these are are now manufactured in China. When they had to shut down because of their own challenge, we were left in a lurch. So we had to be very creative in terms of uh, working with, uh, figuring out how to keep our front lines supplied with the protective equipment they needed to safely provide care. We created a number of alternate sources. We went straight to uh, distributors and manufacturers in uh, uninvolved parts of China. We had chartered flights bringing things in from from Mexico, from China. We had uh, an upholstery uh, manufacturer in South uh, Georgia work on creating cloth masks for us. We, as, as many of you know, our biomedical engineering department at Emory is a shared department with Georgia Tech. We asked them to solve a face shield problem worked together to design one, and the Georgia Tech folks helped us manufacture thousands and thousands of face shields, supplying the whole city with the face shields they needed. So again, uh, very creative in how we managed it. And then the last part was the generosity of the community. We opened up a donation center, got literally tens of thousands of N95 masks, other masks, hundreds of thousands of gloves from places like Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, dentist offices, podiatry offices, many of the areas that were closed donated their supplies. I talked to Mr. Randall Rollins and asked him, hey, do you have impervious uh, over you know, um, coveralls for your pesticide workers? Well, sure enough, we got 500 orchid exterminator uh, coveralls that were impervious and could be used to protect our workers. So everything we needed to do, and it was a great outpouring. Uh, next slide, please. The next challenge uh, was a big one, and I call it the surgery precipice. Here you can see our weekly surgery volumes. Uh, The green line is our total volumes, blue was our ambulatory surgery, and gray in the middle were our inpatient surgery. And as you can see, um, in early March, in order to be able to allow the, uh, to preserve PPE, um, we stopped surgery, elective, anything but emergent. Even people who had cancer, if it didn't have to be operated on, you know, this week, this uh, this month, uh, we put it off in order to be able to support the huge uh, needs for the COVID patients. Uh, and that had two things. First of all, it did free up the supplies we needed. It freed up the people we needed uh, in order to treat these in these uh, ballooning the tsunami of COVID patients. But from a financial perspective. Uh, we dropped the first, the last two weeks of uh, March, we had an $85 million loss. The month of April, where you can see it was the bottom of that trough, uh, we had $139 million loss in one month versus budget. So we, um, it was a significant step and it's a hole that we've been uh, recovering from. You can see starting in May, we started the upslope um, finally by, uh, This month, we're at about 85% of our pre-COVID volumes, but still very challenging financially. And we can talk about that as well. Uh, Next slide. The The real challenge was making sure we had the beds and equipment for something that we thought we might be the next New York City. Uh, when we saw that initial increase. So we did a a number of things. We increased, we have the highest number of of, um, ICU beds, I believe in the state. We started off with over 300 ICU beds in our system, uh, mostly because of the acuity, the severity of the patients we typically treat at Emory. But we increased by 50 our ICU beds. We ordered 50 more ventilators uh, and actually got them delivered by the beginning of May. We beat the rush on equipment. Uh, So we were ready. We were prepared. We started converting our ICUs from non-COVID to COVID, starting at two hospitals, then going to three, then going to four. Uh, Right now, we're up to five of our hospitals that have specific COVID units and COVID ICUs. Uh, And we we did this all to prepare to make sure we wouldn't get caught flat-footed. Next slide, please. Much of what we learned was from our patients and what we needed to do to deal with both the uh, panic in the community as well as the real need 
in the community. So one of the first things that we did was our uh, investigators, our, bio, our, our um, uh, biomedical informatics team, along with our emergency medicine team, our Center for Emergency Preparedness, worked and created a symptom checker app a symptom checker website that would allow patients to assess their needs for more care electronically without having to call their doctor because there were not enough phone lines for all the people who were worried in the beginning of March. Um, we've had over a million users of, of that app. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, that's the uh, app at the bottom if you're interested, c19check.com. And what it allows you to do is to enter your age, a couple, you know, a couple of other uh, factors, and then what symptoms you might have. And it, it gives you the CDC's latest guidelines on what you should do, whether you should go to an emergency room, call your doctor, um, take some, uh, again, just stay home, don't worry. Uh, it, it will tell you what you, what, what you need to do. Uh, in addition, we set up a COVID hotline. Uh, we fielded now over 80,000 calls from the community uh, since in the months since we set that up to be able to very quickly determine if the, if one did need to be seen, how acute was it? Did they need to be tested, et cetera? We um, set up multiple drive-through testing centers, an offsite acute respiratory clinic, a virtual outpatient management clinic. We created separate entrances for all of our emergency rooms for those with respiratory symptoms versus the rest of the patients who didn't go away, you still had heart attacks and strokes and everything else we take care of at Emory. Um, we've continued to screen over 20,000 people at these um, respiratory clinics and outpatient clinics uh, as we've moved forward. And it's been incredibly gratifying. We've now admitted over 3,600 patients at Emory with COVID. Uh, and we have more than a 92% survival rate of those patients, which if you compare it to what we saw in New York City, what they saw in Italy, we're very proud of where we are. Our ICU patient survival is now pushing close to 80%. So we're very proud of what we've achieved for the patients, which, which really is the bottom line. Next slide. Um, well, we had to learn a lot about operations to ramp things up that quickly. For those of you who work in any business, you know, Quick change is not easy. And in fact, with the Incident Command Center, things that used to take us maybe three to six months to make a decision to implement a change, we did that in a week. Things that used to take us two or three weeks or a month, we did in a day. So tremendous um, changes in our protocols, in our procedures around masking, visitation policies, temperature checking, testing, N95 processing, uh, telehealth, is something where the month before COVID in February, we did about 100 um, telehealth visits during the month in our Emory Clinic doctors and, and uh, nurses. Uh, we've now done over 210,000 telehealth visits, about 3,000 a day. Uh, we ramped that up within about two to three weeks. So right now we're doing 30% of our outpatient uh, doctor visit volume through telehealth. Never would have guessed we would be there. We'd been hoping to do it for years. Uh, probably would not have gotten there for another four or five years. Uh, next slide, please. The main thing that we uh, worked with was working with our people. And much like many of your businesses, we rapidly had to move much of our workforce offsite to full-time remote. All of our back office, we moved offsite. Um, we had to set up the IT infrastructure create the Zoom meetings, do all the IT training for that, create the uh, performance metrics uh, to be able to monitor our people. And, and again, as, as uh, Bill mentioned, we have about over 24,000 Emory Healthcare employees alone, not to mention the rest of the health sciences. So it was a major undertaking. Also, we had to redeploy our clinical staff. When we closed down surgery, when we closed down almost all of our ambulatory offices, in that first few weeks. We redeployed those staff into our call centers, into our front lines, retrained them to be able to work with COVID patients, a lot of work. And uh, we had to make sure our own workforce was safe and healthy. We've tested over 7,000 of our own healthcare providers. What's fascinating uh, is uh, two things. First of all, what we found is 
We have yet to document a case where one of our healthcare workers actually caught COVID from a patient. There may be a case. We have not found it. We have not found evidence of it. What we have found is lots of our healthcare workforce, um, or those a lot, most of the ones who uh, who had COVID. Again, not luckily, the prevalence is still about community prevalence in our workforce. They caught it in the community. They caught it from going out uh, with friends. They caught it from having a birthday party. They brought it in. And unfortunately, in those first few weeks, they spread it to each other. We started a universal masking policy. We first started encouraging masks. Probably 80% of the people wore masks all the time. We still saw up to 15, 16 people a day who were testing positive. We made a mandatory universal masking for Emory Healthcare, provide any, anyone who wasn't in an office alone or socially distanced while eating in a break room, which was a challenge. Um, and we dropped off to zero to two cases per day within about a week. So it really made a huge difference and has kept it down. We've now increased to include eye shields as well. Um, we completed serology testing on more than 11,000 of our team members as well, looking for antibodies. Glad to talk about that if we have time as well. Uh, the main thing we worked on was morale. Um, our people are our most important uh, aspect of Emory Healthcare. We wanted to make sure they were staying safe. Next slide. And innovation was really important. Um, when this started, the whole state of Georgia could only do about 20 tests a day for the whole state. So our lab uh, folks set up our own test. We were testing about 80 to 100 a day when the state was still only doing 20 to 40. And we were able to start um, taking those people who we call persons under investigation to decide which of them really had COVID, who just had another respiratory symptom respiratory issue. We developed new ways to clean and sterilize and reuse equipment, innovative ways for patients to communicate with their loved ones outside the hospital. And importantly, our ICU doctors innovated around guidelines, best practices for patient care, things like ventilator use or medications. Uh, and really it led to great outcomes in our ICU but we were able to roll that out nationally. So intensive care units across the country could learn from Emory innovations and move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, well, we are an academic medical center, and that means we've got schools of medicine, public health, nursing, a big uh, animal research facility, as well as, uh, again, a, a cancer center, lots and lots of scientists who do great work. Well, when this first started, before we even we had seen our first patient, many of our scientists had moved to uh, switch their research over to COVID research. And they've made a huge difference in what they've done. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we were the second place in the country and one of three, uh, ultimately, to do the phase one vaccine trial of Moderna, which is the one of the vaccine trials that's gone now into phase three trials. Um, we're actually, we will we will be standing up the phase three trial of Moderna. Um, and I believe it's starting up next week or the week after. Uh, we're one of two centers running monoclonal antibody trials for the NIH, along with the uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, we were the largest uh, enroller in remdesivir, the clinical uh, trial that actually got the only FDA approved drug uh, approved. Uh, and we're now doing actually in a third phase of, of testing of remdesivir, looking at it in combination with other drugs. And uh, we have a number of antiviral therapeutic trials, both Emory discovered drugs, as well as drugs elsewhere uh, that are really important uh, to move forward. Emory is, uh, runs one of the four uh, national networks of vaccine testing and therapeutic trials across the country. So we've been sort of in the center of designing most of the NIH-based trials. Next slide. Um, we've worked on uh, looking for new diagnostic tools and diagnostic testing. The NIH created a $1.5 billion initiative to try to figure out how to test more quickly. Well, they made, uh, they gave the grant for the primary test validation site to Emory. Uh, it was $31 million, the biggest single grant uh, we've ever gotten from the NIH. And it's a, a grant we work uh, in combination with 
It's well, actually, the principal investigator is a professor at Emory who's also practices at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and has a lab at Georgia Tech. So it brings those three institutions together to really make a difference. Um, we've been uh, our School of Public Health is looking at what's the prevalence of antibodies across the country, a number of other innovations. Uh, next slide. I'd like to finish up in my last few minutes just talking about recovery. And so you saw what happened when our surgery dropped off. Well, that causes for a lot of challenges in recovery. And just when we thought things were getting better in June, you saw what happened uh, with our volumes increasing. Next slide. So what are the headwinds that we need to um, we need to meet? Well, first of all, we have to be ready for an ongoing pandemic with continued surges, which may continue to grow bigger than the last. Each may be bigger than the last. There's no saying that that's not going to happen. Um, one of the challenges that we worked on along with our peers has been uh, peer institutions has been regaining consumer confidence to be able to have them come for their routine care because lots of people were injured, not from COVID, but because they had chest pain and didn't come to the emergency room or they had face tingling and didn't come to call their doctor or go to the emergency room because they were afraid to come have care. Well, in fact, there's probably nowhere safer than uh, an ambulatory doctor's office or a uh, hospital because of the strictness of our, our masking inside, our cleaning protocols. So that's something we've needed to work on. The financial recovery and the broader economy is something that we're going to see. And we've already seen an increase in uninsured. Uh, and we've uh, done over $15 million of uninsured uh, COVID care for Georgia, the uh, Georgia citizens already. The social unrest is clearly a challenge. And the uncertainty of really not knowing when is that next surge going to come. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we doing? What's our way forward? What might you do as uh, the community moves forward? Well, first of all, we're preparing for ongoing surges and resurgences. Our PPE supplies now have many weeks of supply to be able to meet the challenge. Um, we've re-engineered our operations to have, in, in essence, parallel hospitals and health systems. We've got COVID-19 system for all the patients who we may need to treat. And we have a non-COVID system uh, within the same walls where we have separate units, separate uh, hospital floors, where patients uh, with non-COVID can get safe and important care as well. Most of our patients are still non-COVID. When you look at our 2,600 beds, even if we have 350 of them filled with COVID, most of our patients still are other, other patients. Um, we've worked on balancing the financial stewardship with our clinical recovery, which has been challenging because of the needs for clinical staff, working on consumer confidence. And importantly, one of the first things that I did uh, back in March was I called my peer CEOs at the other health systems across the city, said, what can we do to work together? We had testing up and running, said, if you have trouble with testing, we're hoping to expand we'd be happy to help with, for, with your testing. Um, so we've collaborated with our peer health systems. We started daily calls uh, with uh, Emory, Grady, Piedmont, Wellstar, Children's, ultimately Northeast Georgia joined in. We still do those three days a week with our primary operators, our, our chief operating officers of all those systems talking, what's going on in your system? What are you seeing? It's interesting, that's how I knew that we were about a week ahead. We're a leading indicator uh, in the upslope because as we talked to them in this last surge, they're all saying, we're looking good. What are you all talking about? About a week later, their numbers started up. Um, one of the things you may have seen on Sunday, if I could have the next slide, uh, was actually something you probably never would have guessed. Here's an ad we put in, put your health first, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, the three W's. And at the bottom, that's a combined ad, Emory, Children's, Grady, Piedmont, and Wellstar. So we are working together as a community of healthcare providers to really keep you all safe and uh, safe and well. Uh, next slide. And just to finish up, one of the most important things we're doing is leveraging the goodwill and support of our community. And this Atlanta community has really come out to support us. The donors that have helped, the Cox Foundation, Kennedy and Cox family members, Woodruff Foundation, the Rollins Foundation, and individual members of the Rollins family, the Marcus Foundation, the William Randolph Hearst Foundation, 
the Amos family, countless others across the community have stepped up, helped us buy much of the equipment. Again, the uh, prices on everything went up by a factor of 10 the minute that this this uh, hit. And many, without the goodwill of this community, we would not be where we are now, taking care of people. And the last thing I'll say is the focus on our people has been the most critical thing, making sure that they are all well. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, that, thank you for your attention. Stay well, and I'm glad to answer some questions. Thanks, John. That was uh, that was terrific. It's obviously you have put together a, uh, in however you do it with 30,000 plus people, a, uh, a nimble organization, and you reacted quickly. Every consultant pitches uh, major corporations that they can do that for them. So uh, my congratulations on uh, changing the organization that fast. Uh, you know, most of the audience here are business people themselves, and they're looking for messaging uh, to, hand, to pass down to their employees. And I love the three W's. Uh, we've all been saying the same thing, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, in, in our messaging. But, you know, one question I would have for you, when it comes to vaccines, as you roll the tape forward, what should the business leaders you're talking to now say to their employees about the effectiveness, the timing, the uh, when will a when will a uh, vaccine be able to induce appropriate amount of immunity to be able to last long enough to do anybody any good? Well, you know we're fortunate. There are actually six vaccine phase three trials either starting or about to start. Uh, Moderna and Pfizer both began tests last week. Eventually, they'll each include about thirty thousand volunteers. Again, we're going to start enrolling probably in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in the next few months, equally large calls of volunteers are going to go out for test uh, uh, vaccines made by several other, um, four other manufacturers, not including the ones that are being tested in China or smaller stage studies. Um, so I, I'm pretty confident that one of these is going to work. Again, the preliminary study that we did with Moderna was very positive in terms of antibody production. The challenge is going to be producing enough vaccine to really take care of the community. So there's gonna be, there won't be enough for everyone who wants it right away, um, especially because many of the most potential, most of these uh, require two doses. So um, the, the federal government has set up a couple of uh, guidance committees, to the National Academy of Medicine, uh, the Advisory Committee on Immuniza Immunization Practices. Actually, our own Bill Fagey here in Atlanta is running uh, the Academy's deliberations which uh, are bringing together ethicists, vaccine experts to decide how do we vaccinate. And what's likely gonna happen is we'll start off with frontline healthcare workers, because again, if they're out ill, we can't take care of the rest of the community. Other high risk people, first responders are gonna come first. So to manufacture 300 million doses, for example, for the US um, is gonna take a while. My guess is we won't finish vaccination until the end of 2021. So we have to figure out other ways to mitigate and contain the virus um, for, for quite a while. Well, I've been reading a book on the pandemic of 1918, and it was about a three-year roller coaster ride uh, that uh, is historically seems to be uh, in parallel. Um, and I like to hear about the, the vaccines coming out. And parochially, does that mean Atlanta gets the first set of doses or the first set of, uh, you know, the, of, uh, of bad uh, after effects. Oh, and uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, no. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, you know. Again, there, there, there won't be uh, bad after effects. There won't be uh, too many side effects. But what's interesting is one of the groups that's going to get the first set of doses, most likely based on the ethicists, is these um, thirty thousand person phase three trials. Well, half the people get the vaccine. Half of them get a shot, a sham shot, a, a placebo. So one of the first things that will happen if it works is the people who got the placebo are going to get vaccinated. They were yeah, willing to get it and yeah. they, they took a risk and didn't have it. Uh, some of them will have gotten COVID. Um, but yeah, we you know Atlanta, hopefully those those groups, which Atlanta will include Atlantans. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to be in the same way. We'll be with uh, the same as the rest of the country. Well, there'll be a priority, prioritization. I understand that. You, but you never can, um, you never can tell. Um, how about testing how do how do our business people talk about testing with their employees how important is it is it limited is it um don't go unless you have to i love the fact that 
I wrote down the c19check.com is just to me a layup in terms of having that resource available to whoever in Atlanta needs it. Yeah, testing has been one of the biggest challenges we've had. We as Georgians are now 20, still 27th in the country in terms of test volumes, despite being number eight in our population volume, in our, uh, uh, in our uh, population. So it's been a real challenge. And in fact, we just had a cut, uh, a cut in a, the number of tests that we're able to do from one of the manufacturers. There is a global shortage of testing capacity and the US is eating up 75% of it. Uh, and because of our caseload, um, it's not enough for what we need. So um, the, the challenge is right now, the major labs are not getting a test back for a week or even more. Um, it makes it challenging. People who have symptoms should get tested. Uh, contacts of people who have had sim symptoms should get tested and should quarantine until the test comes back if they live in a household with somebody who has COVID, for example, so they not spread it to others. But the most important people can think people can do is to wear a mask. The reason, again, my mask protects you, your mask protects me, but together our masks protect the economy. So if everyone wore a mask, um, we could reopen more quickly, we could reopen more successfully, uh, we'd stop spreading it to each other. So more important than testing, I would say is masking. Make sure that Correct. your employees yeah. wear masks at work and actually outside of work. Great, uh, great message. Um, so one last question before I turn it back to Canon is how is the how has the care model changed in the last four or five months in terms of, hey, I've got I've got symptoms to um, you're symptom free and now you have an antibodies, which seem to be the holy grail. Yeah, there's a couple of things that we've recognized. Uh, one is that uh, we've now we now realize that the amount of time that someone is infective, uh, infectious, is actually relatively limited. It's about 10 days uh, for most of us. People who are really sick it could be 20 days. Um, but what we were doing at the beginning was we were trying to retest and we we're waiting for two negative tests before we would say someone was fine. Turns out the RNA that we test lasts for a while. So one change in the care model is that we no longer should be doing repeat tests. We should assume that you know 10 days out from uh, the symptoms or 48, 24 to 48 hours out from the last fever, um, people actually are, are no longer symptomatic. Again, um, it's, it's really important that they stay, stay apart. Um, so that's one change. Our, our health care, our hospital care has improved greatly. We've learned so much about how to take care of the patients. Again, in, in New York, you saw 20% uh, survivals in if you got into an ICU on a ventilator, we're now between 70%. So again, lots and lots of uh, care model innovations and improvements as well for hospitalized patients. Well, thank you. We're right at the top of the hour. So thank you again for your time because I know you're flat out busy with uh, with uh, all that you've got going on. And um, Cannon, over to you, my friend. Well, thank you. Uh, Bill, thanks for hosting. And Dr. Lewin, uh, great insights from everything from uh, the state of the economy and the state of, uh, of, of health, uh, all the way to the frontline workers and, and how it's affected your operations. Um, we did have many more questions from the floor. I thought maybe just in closing, two quick questions for you. One, uh, what is, we touched on it, but what is your view of immunity at this point? What do we know about it? And then secondly, uh, as you look, you know, five, 10 years down the road, what if anything has changed. I mean, the COVID uh, crisis in some respects has accelerated existing trends, but what in your view has changed permanently? So immunity and permanent change. Yeah, so so the um, data on immunity is still getting is still getting developed. From what we see, we actually, our, our scientists at Emory have developed a uh, neutralizing assay that can look to see, are the antibodies that someone has actually able to neutralize the virus? And what we're seeing at least uh, to, right now suggests that we do as people who are infected, again, fortunately not me yet, but hopefully not, but uh, we, folks who are, are infected do develop antibodies that likely do confer immunity. The challenge is gonna be, we don't know how long that lasts. And we're just doing the studies now to see, does it last a month, three months, six months, a year or longer? Those studies are going on now. So um, the reason why we say, well, if you had it once, still be careful, 
is because we don't know. And, and perhaps in, in, in fact, people who have had very mild COVID make less antibodies. Than people who have had a severe, a severe case. So right now, the best thing to do is to use the precautions, consider everyone asymptomatic or symptomatic as potentially infectious, and to wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear a mask. Um, the second question, uh, and actually remind me of the second question. I'm sorry. <laughs> So the second question was just uh, what's changed permanently, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, no, no, got it. Uh, I think a lot of things, you know, I, I clearly for us, we have found that Zoom meetings are uh, just as just as effective as in-person meetings for many of our areas. So, you know, I'm, I'm on the uh, board of several uh, national organizations where we would fly to Phoenix or fly to Chicago every quarter for a meeting. I'm not sure that those flights are, are going to continue, certainly not quarterly. Um, telehealth uh, has been an incredible uh, satisfier for the patients because uh, if you have chronic renal failure and they're just you're just going to be talking to your doctor anyways, why get in a car, drive down, park, worry about walking in? Um, telehealth is here to stay. Uh, so I think both remote working and telehealth are going to be here for a long time, and uh, it will be interesting to see what does the new reality look like uh, once COVID is behind us? And it will be behind us. We will have a vaccine that works. We'll have herd immunity, uh, presumably through the vaccine. Um, but it's going to be a bit of a different world in several ways. Well, uh, Dr. Lewin, thank you for your thoughts there. It'll be fascinating uh, to see things unfold. And certainly 18 months from now, we'd love to have you back and, uh, and kind of see what we've learned and, and where, where, we, where we're headed. So thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. You well, thank, you. thank you for having me. Absolutely.